Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar on navigating Shell's open enrollment, which is coming up soon. Um, we want to talk a little bit today about how to make the right elections for you and your family. And we want to talk about three mistakes to avoid when you're looking at your benefits in the open enrollment period. My name is Alexis Long. I'm the Director of Wealth Management here at Willis Johnson & Associates. I am a CFP and I've been here at WJA since 2014. Um, I'm a member of the Financial Planning Association of Houston and I focus on helping our Shell and Chevron clients understand their benefits and the complexities that those benefits will bring. Our firm, Willis Johnson & Associates, is an award-winning financial planning firm, and we specialize in helping professionals and executives at leading energy companies to optimize their benefits and understand how they tie into their tax planning, their investment planning, and all the other areas of their financial life. And our thorough understanding of the transitions in your corporate life will allow you to appreciate where you've been and assist you with where you're going. So we take the time to understand you by combining employee benefit expertise and financial planning wisdom with the emotional elements of your life. When people first come in to meet with us, they often ask, what makes WJA so different? Well, we look at your full financial picture and build your priorities into a long-term plan that's uniquely yours. We're also a fiduciary advisor all the time. So what exactly does that mean? It means that we only offer advice that's in your best interest. And only 12% of firms, including ourselves, are considered fee-only firms, which simply means that the only way that we are paid is through the transparent fee that our clients pay for our services. Um, other firms out there are going to sell products, receive incentives or commissions or other income that's directly related to investment or insurance options that they'll recommend for you. But when we make recommendations, it's just advice focused and in your best interest every single time. Tax track can also have a huge impact on a portfolio, so we offer tax planning and advice alongside our financial planning offerings to lessen our clients' tax burdens over time. And we have CPAs on our staff that aid in the preparation and filing of our clients' tax returns. And finally, we have that company benefit expertise. So many firms will understand the ins and outs of a 401k plan, and we've taken it one step further. We've actually read your benefit books and understand your benefit plans so that we can help our clients make sure that they're getting the most from what those plans have to offer. So for today's webinar, um, we are going to have a conversation about open enrollment if you have questions on anything that we cover today or anything that I cover today, please include it in the pop-up survey that will follow the webinar and we will happily follow up with you. So what's on the agenda for the day? This is the agenda. Um, when is Shell's open enrollment? When we're going to talk about which medical plans you should be considering for your family. We want to cover HSAs versus FSAs. Then we're going to talk a little bit about long then we're going to talk a little bit about short and long-term disability options, then life insurance and talk about how much you may need, followed by next steps. So when is open enrollment? Shell's annual open enrollment period starts October 25th through November 8th, 2023. So during this period of time, you can make elections for your medical plans, your life insurance, and your disability insurance coverage through the Shell employee portal. So mark it on your calendar. So first thing we'll cover is which medical plan you should choose. So you have three options through the Shell plan. You have a United Healthcare PPO plan, you have a Kelsey Siebold um, PPO plan, and a United Healthcare high deductible plan. So when we're considering these three options, for most of our clients, we will recommend one of the two United Healthcare plans. The reason being, it has a much broader reach. It is a national organization. Um, and so regardless of where you go in the country, um, across the world, you will likely have United Healthcare coverage. Kelsey Siebold is really local to the Houston area and the Gulf Coast area. Um, so we typically don't recommend this plan for our clients, although it's a less expensive option. Um, it just doesn't have the same reach as the United Healthcare. So if you have a child that's in college in another state um, or you travel a lot, the Kelsey Siebold plan probably doesn't make sense for you. 
So we tend to stick with those United Healthcare plans. Um, the PPO plan at United Healthcare um, tends to be a higher premium, while the United while the health, high deductible plan has a lower premium. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more on the next slide about which plan is better depending on your certain situation. So in order to illustrate some of these plans, some of these benefit plans today, I want to use some examples of two different couples. We have Bob and Anna. They're both age 55. Um, and then we have Trisha and Ryan, who are also both aged 55. So our first example here, Bob and Anna. Bob and Anna selected a PPO plan when they first started at Shell, when Bob first started at Shell, because they were willing to pay the higher premiums in order to avoid out-of-pocket expenses for the deductible. They've been there for 25 years and never made a change. They're also not using their FSA, um, their health care account, but Bob and Anna are super healthy. They only go to the doctor for preventative care and for maintenance, so they're only going to the doctor one or two times a year. Trisha and Ryan, on the other hand, both age 55 again, um, they did select the United Healthcare high deductible plan when they first started with Shell because they were young and healthy at the time. They have not made any contributions to their HSA, though, while they've been on this plan. And now that they are a little bit older, they do have chronic health conditions, and so they are spending a lot of time at the doctor, visiting the doctor. So let's break down the differences between the PPO and the high deductible health plans. So the PPO has higher premiums, but lower deductibles. So there's less out of pocket expense. The deductible per person on the shell plan is $325. For the family, it's $650 max. On the PPO plan, you cannot use an HSA. You cannot use a health savings account but you can use a flexible spending account. PPOs are really great for individuals that have ongoing health costs and need ongoing medication, so a lot of medical expenses. High deductible plans, on the other hand, lower premiums, but higher deductibles. So the deductible for an individual on the Shell high deductible plan is $1,600. For other coverages, it's $3,200. So there are higher out-of-pocket expenses. But on the high deductible plan, you are eligible to use a health savings account. So you can make HSA contributions on a high deductible plan. So high deductible plans are a really good fit for those individuals that are maintaining their health, don't go to see the doctor very often, and don't have a lot of ongoing medical expenses. So for Bob and Anna, if you remember, they are both very healthy, only go to the doctor once or twice a year for preventative care, and they've been on the PPO plan since they started at Shaw. When we did a review of their benefits, we decided to make the recommendation of, hey, let's move to the high deductible plan because you guys aren't really going to the doctor. You can pay the out-of-pocket expenses, and you can start using an HSA, which you get some tax deductibility on your income. So it's a great option for them, and they decide to move over to the high deductible plan. But what about Trisha and Ryan? So if you remember, Trisha and Ryan were on the high deductible plan, but they weren't contributing to their HSA. So they have a lot of medical expenses that they're paying out of pocket, not even out of an HSA, because they're having to go to the doctor regularly for their chronic health conditions. So when we reviewed their plans together with them, we made the recommendation to move off the high deductible plan and over to the PPO. There are higher monthly premiums, but lower out-of-pocket expenses, so that insurance coverage kicks in faster. But they do have to give up contributing to the HSA, although they can start to contribute to the FSA, the flexible savings account, um, to get some pre-tax deductions there, um, even though the FSA is not as beneficial as an HSA, which we're going to talk about next. So things to consider as you are making a decision during open enrollment on which medical plan you want to choose for you and your family. So let's talk about the HSA and the FSA and what the differences are between these two types of plans. I see these plans regularly confused. Um, you know, there's also a Shell has a, a dependent care FSA also to throw in the mix, um, and they are regularly confused with each other. So let's talk a little bit about what these two types of plans are. So let's break down the differences between a health savings account 
and a flexible spending account. There are some big differences here. HSAs or health savings accounts are ideal for people that have very low medical expenses and are on a high deductible health plan. Contributions to an HSA are tax deductible. They go in pre-tax before federal income taxes. And if you're making contributions through payroll, you avoid FICA taxes as well. The contributions can grow over time tax deferred and they can be invested in HSAs. In the HSA at Shell, Shell does make some contributions as well. The flexible spending account, on the other hand, can be used with any type of plan that is not a high deductible plan, so it can be used with the PPO plan. Similarly, contributions are pre-tax and avoid FICA taxes, but one of the biggest differences here is that contributions reset annually. So if you do not use the money in your FSA, by the end of the year, you lose it. So use it or lose it. And Shell does not make any contributions to the FSA for their employees. So there are IRS imposed limits on HSAs. Um, the HSA limits for 2023 are dependent upon what type of coverage you have. But if you have self-only coverage, you can contribute up to $3,850. If you have family coverage, you can contribute up to $7,750. If you're the over the age 50, you can do an additional catch-up contribution of $1,000 to the HSA. Additionally, on the HSA savings, Shell makes contributions for you. So they will put in $500 if you're an individual and $1,000 for all other coverages. So to go back to my last slide, if you are self-only coverage, Shell will put in $500 for you. And that means that you can put an additional $3,350 of contributions as the employee to reach the IRS maximum for the 2023 calendar year. Benefits of HSA. I kind of already talked about this, but the contributions are tax deductible, just like your 401k contributions. They grow tax deferred in the HSA and when withdrawn for qualified medical expenses, those withdrawals are tax free. And then as the money stays in there, it's tax deferred until you withdraw it. Um, and if you withdraw it after age 65 for any expense, you only pay ordinary income taxes on the dollars just like a traditional IRA. So great benefits here with an HSA, um, especially if you're a high income earner and you're maxing out your 401k plan. The only other place that you can really save pre-tax dollars is in the HSA. So make sure you're considering whether this is an option that's right for you and your family and take advantage of it if it is. So I love this slide because it really outlines the difference between the PPO the high deductible plan, and then the HSA um, coupled together. So to break this down a little bit, this is um, the difference in expense for Bob and Anna. Currently, they are on the PPO plan. Annually for their family, they pay $6,156 a year. So I love this slide because it really outlines the cost differences between the two plans that we've been talking about here. Let's go back to our example of Bob and Anna. Um, their annual cost for the family premium on the PPO right now is $6,156. If they were to move over to the high deductible plan for their family, the cost would be $3,852. So the high deductible plan does have lower premiums. Um, but we also need to think about the deductible. So this is the out-of-pocket cost. Um, on the PPO plan, their deductible for the family is $650. So total cost, if they use all their deductible for the year and then they're paying their monthly premiums, they would spend $6,806 annually. On the high deductible plan for family, the deductible is $3,200. So if they used up their entire deductible, on the high deductible plan, plus the cost of the premiums, they would be spending a little bit more on the high deductible plan versus the PPO, about $7,052 annually. But the cost difference is just not huge. And for Bob and Anna, considering that they're high income earners, it makes a lot of sense for them to go on this high deductible plan because they can maximize contributions into the HSA. And given their health is very good, they likely wouldn't even use all of that deductible if they're not going to the doctor regularly. So this makes a lot, a lot of sense for this client. 
Here's a little bit more on the cost. Um, the PPO monthly premium, and we talked about this on the last slide what the annual premium was, but the monthly premium is $513. Um, so again, PPOs make sense if you're paying or if you're going to the doctor regularly. If you're on a high deductible plan, the premium for a family is $321 a month. The difference between these two premiums monthly is $192 a month. But what if you took that $192 and put it into the HSA and invest it? So you move over to the high deductible plan, you take the additional savings, contribute to the HSA, invest it over time. Annually, that $192 a month becomes $2,304 um, in a year. If we take that um, and multiply that times 40 years, um, we would have contributions to HSA of $96,000. So if you started working at Shell when you were 22, right out of college, um, use that $2,400 a year and put it into the HSA up until you retire, you'd make total contributions of $96,000. Um, if you invested those funds in the HSA without any tax drag, because remember, those HSA contributions are pre-tax, you never take any withdrawals out, you pay out of pocket for any medical expenses and just let the HSA grow, the HSA could be valued at approximately $622,000 at the end of that 40-year period. If you had done the same thing, the same investment strategy with a brokerage account, an after-tax brokerage account, and assuming a 25% tax drag, the brokerage account would only be worth $466,000. So this is just to illustrate the benefit of contributing to pre-tax accounts where we can. In this example, you've lost over 25% of the value of your account just due to tax drag. So wanting to illustrate, truly to illustrate the benefit of using an HSA versus an after-tax brokerage account. So there are some strategies that we talk to clients about with the HSA. Um, you can take the money out as needed to pay for medical expenses. Qualified medical expenses are very broad. There are a lot of them and a lot of different types of qualified medical expenses. So some people just use their HSA as it was intended to be used. You could also, in the HSA, hold the annual deductible amount, the $3,200, for example, if you're a family in cash and then invest the remainder. So you always have that 3200 available, you can cover with cash and invest the rest. Or you can also pay out of pocket for medical expenses, just pay out of your bank account, put it on your credit card, and then fully invest your HSA and claim reimbursement down the road. You can reimburse yourself from an HSA many years down the road as long as you've held on to the receipts for the medical expense. So let's move on to the Trisha and Ryan example that we were talking about earlier. So Trisha and Ryan um, go on to the PPO plan, but decide they still really like the idea of using the FSA, the flexible savings account. Um, at Shell, they call it the healthcare account. At Shell, the contribution limit for the FSA is $2,850 this year. Um, there's also an option to use an FSA for dependent care. This would be care for your children under the age of 13 um, or any other type of family member that um, needs care. You can contribute up to $5,000 tax deductible into this account and use it for child care, daycare, nanny, et cetera. Um, so those are the two different types of flexible savings accounts available through the Shell plan. With the FSA, you have the option to use it for medical expenses as well. And there are options out there. They're actually like stores specifically focused on showing you what you can use your FSA for. So if you get to the end of the year, you have $500 left in the uh, plan, you're worried about it because you're going to lose it. You can go to Amazon. There's an FSA store on Amazon. There's also an FSA store on the internet where you can find, um, you know, Tums, band-aids, um, ointments, all types of things that you can use your FSA or even your HSA for. Um, but especially if you're using an FSA and you're worried about losing those dollars at the end of the year, go out there and look for what you could spend those dollars on, on things that you might need going into the next year. Now I'm gonna move on and talk about short and long-term disability options. We're gonna keep using our examples of Bob and Anna and Trisha and Ryan. So remember, we've got Bob and Anna, 55 years old, Trisha and Ryan, 55 years old. Bob has worked at Shell for 25 years. His annual salary is $250,000. 
Um, he is only covered by the Shell short-term coverage, and he and Anna are not quite yet financially independent. On the other hand, we have Trisha and Ryan. Also, Trisha has been at Shell for 25 years. Her annual salary is $250,000. Um, she is enrolled in the Shell provided short term disability coverage, and she has opted to um, enroll in supplemental short term coverage and the supplemental long term coverage that's offered through Shell. Trisha and Ryan are also financially independent. So, what is short term disability? Short term disability covers you for income if you have a disabling event for up to 52 weeks. The amount that you receive is either 100 or 50 percent of base pay and that's dependent upon years of service. You do have short-term coverage through Shell that Shell pays for, but you can as an employee buy supplemental short-term coverage and this coverage will start on the first day of your absence due to a disabling event. Long-term coverage will cover you for up to 24 months and potentially beyond if you have proof of continued disability. If you have a disabling event um, that you do not heal from or you do not um, get better from, you can prove, as long as you can prove you're continuing to be disabled, you can have coverage up to your lifetime. This coverage will cover you up to 60% of eligible pay um, and it is paid for by the employee. And this will start after that 52 week period that short term covers. So let's dig into this a little bit more. Here's the breakdown of how the short term disability coverage, like I mentioned in the last slide, it is very dependent upon years of service. So um, if we're looking at this schedule here, you know, if you have one year of service, you can get two weeks max of full pay and you'll get four weeks of half pay for a total coverage of six weeks of pay. Um, versus if you have been at Shell for over 12 years, you get a full year of coverage, 13 weeks max of full pay, whereas 39 of those weeks would be half pay. So this is the Shell sponsored coverage, short-term disability. There's also a supplemental income protection plan um, or IPI as it's shortened to. This is what an employee can opt into and pay for additional coverage. You have the option of buying additional 50% coverage or 25% coverage in addition to what Shell is providing to you. And it's kind of dependent here. Um, you can see the payouts dependent upon what your annual base pay is. These supplemental plans, actually these short-term plans, do not cover bonuses or stock compensation. It's just based on annual base pay. So keep that in mind when you're looking at these plans. Um, but if you have a salary of over $260,000, um, you could be receiving $2,500 a week or $1,250 a week, just depending on what option you elect. So let's talk about that in an example. So we have Bob and Anna again. Um, Bob gets hurt and he goes on short-term disability for 52 weeks. Remember, he's been at Shell for 25 years, so he is going to receive 52 weeks of pay. 13 weeks of those are going to be full pay. 39 will be half pay. So if we break that down into dollars, if he did not have supplemental short-term coverage, he would be receiving $156,208 annually if he, if he was disabled over the full 52 weeks on his base pay versus $250,000 of what his actual base pay is. That is a pretty significant difference in income. And remember, this doesn't include bonuses or stock compensation, performance shares or the like that he's been receiving over the last 25 years. So this is a big decrease in income. In this case of for Bob, he really should have some income protection insurance be on enrolled in that plan to provide that extra coverage through week 52. So if we kind of look at what that would look like if he had additional coverage through the short term IPI plan, you know, he has that $250,000 base salary through what Shell covers, he would be receiving $156,208 over the entire 52 weeks from just the Shell coverage. 
if he purchased a IPI or enrolled in the IPI plan, which is what we would recommend that he do, he would be able to supplement almost all of his base pay. With the IPI plus the shell coverage, he's almost at back at $250,000, um, very similar to what his base pay is. The shell coverage will be taxable to him, but the coverage, the IPI coverage that he is paying premiums for will be non-taxable because it is after-tax dollars that he contributed to that IPI plan. So that's also something important to keep in mind. Let's move on to the second example here, um, our second couple, Trisha and Ryan. Um, let's say that you know Trisha gets hurt and doesn't recover within the 52 weeks that short-term covers. So she does have to end up going on to long-term disability. So she also has IPI, and her base salary is also $250,000. With her 50% IPI coverage, in addition to what Shell's paying for, she is almost back to $250,000 of coverage on short term. But what happens after those 52 weeks? So 52 weeks later, if she is not better, she's not able to return to work after her disabling event, she would go on to long-term disability coverage. This is paid for by the employee, and the amount that would be paid is up to 60% of your eligible pay, up to $10,250. So that is the max benefit that will be paid out to anybody that works at Shell. So in this case for Trisha, she had a $250,000 salary with her maximum amount that she'd be receiving through long-term coverage, long-term disability coverage, she's receiving $123,000 in a calendar year. So pretty significant difference here with long term. But again, like I mentioned in the last couple of slides, this is employee paid long term disability coverage. That means she paid premiums with after tax dollars. The income to her, that $123,000 is tax free income. So that does help cushion um, the decrease in income a little bit. And given that there are no taxes due. Um, but this is where you really have to, to develop a really strong plan to know that if you had a disabling event, um, you could have some disability coverage, but you would also likely need some additional supplemental um, resources to pull from to cover living expenses, given the difference between the long-term disability benefit and what your base pay is. So moving on to life insurance. This is a big question that we get a lot. Um, do I need life insurance and how much do I need? And it's all dependent upon your personal circumstances. Um, at Shell, employee only coverage, um, you can get one times to seven times annual base pay of life insurance coverage. The maximum amount that you can receive is $4 million. Employees, um, spouses, or domestic partners can receive coverage up to $500,000, um, or you can purchase life insurance coverage for your children, um, $5,000 or $10,000 per child. So again, let's use our examples, Bob and Anna, Trisha and Ryan. Bob and Anna have saved a million dollars in investable assets. Bob's annual salary, again, is $250,000. Their annual expenses are $150,000. Um, coverage that he has through Shell, he is only enrolled in two times the salary coverage, which is the Shell paid for coverage. So his coverage is half a million dollars in life insurance. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned yet in any of our examples, Bob and Anna have two kids who are not financially independent yet, and Bob and Anna are not quite financially independent yet. So if Bob passed away tomorrow, Shell will pay Anna the half a million dollars from the basic insurance coverage. How long would that last if we had half a million dollars plus the million of savings that they have and they're spending $150,000 a year? They're probably only going to be able to cover between 10 to 15 years of living expenses. So that means that Anna would have to either drastically reduce her expenses and change her standard of living or she would have to go back to work. And since she's the sole caregiver of her two children, this would put her in a very difficult place. So we would recommend that Bob looks into purchasing or enrolling in additional coverage through group life with Shell. 
OK, the second example here, um, let's take a look at Trisha and Ryan. Trisha and Ryan do have children, but they are grown, self-sufficient and independent. They've saved $4 million in investable assets. Trisha's income is $250,000, but she's thinking about retiring next year. Their annual expenses are $150,000. In addition to the basic shell coverage, she's elected to pay for five times salary coverage and life insurance. So she has $1.25 million in coverage. So what we want to focus on here are, are two words, um, financial independence. Do Trisha and Ryan really need life insurance coverage if they are close enough to retirement? We typically think about life insurance in terms of human capital replacement. So if Trisha plans to retire soon and her income is going to be gone, they likely do not need life insurance. And since they have grown self-sufficient independent children and their annual spending is a low percentage of what they've saved, um, we really don't need life insurance in this situation. The only reason to potentially consider it would be if they want to leave additional funds behind for their surviving spouse or for their children to inherit additional assets over and above what they currently have. So we would recommend Trisha decreases her life insurance coverage, which would decrease the premiums she's paying on a monthly basis. She can use that offset and cost to put more into her 401k or into other savings plans. This is a breakdown on the premiums for different types of coverage. It's dependent upon your or your spouse's age. Um, the cost of course goes up as you do age for coverage. What about if you decide to leave Shell? Well, if you decide to leave Shell or, or potentially retire, um, your life insurance coverage is portable. So that means you can continue the coverage when you leave Shell. After you leave MetLife, who underwrites insurance at Shell, will send you a packet that details what you need to do to maintain your coverage. Um, so the minimum portable amount for employees is $20,000. Um, you can continue this coverage up until you reach age 80. Um, or for a partner, domestic partner or spouse, the minimal portable coverage is 10,000 and can be extended until they reach age 70. These can also be converted to um, individual life insurance policies. Minimal amount portable for children is 1,000 and can be covered until they reach age 23. So when you're looking at either increasing your life insurance coverage or decreasing your life insurance coverage. First, you just need to determine exactly how much you need in coverage. Do you have young kids? Do you have a spouse that's not working? Are you financially independent? You need to run the numbers. Then you should do your research on premium costs through Shell, what coverage you can get through Shell, or what coverage and premiums are outside of Shell through other providers. Um, maybe it's looking for a term policy with another insurance provider. Then you want to get a plan in place and look at it regularly. So like every other plan we've, we've talked about with our clients, we want our plans to be dy dynamic and reevaluate regularly because life changes very quickly. And so you may need more life insurance today than you will five years down the road. So you want to regularly reevaluate your plan and you want to ask your advisor to walk you through the options educate you on the coverage options that you have available through Shell or what you can obtain outside of Shell. And on that note, um, WJA does not sell insurance. We look at options and provide you with recommendations on best path forward. And I mentioned this earlier, but one of the key things to keep in mind um, is that when you're working with an advisor, whether or not they're fiduciary, only 12% of firms out there are RIA only firms like ours, which act as a fiduciary all the time. So that means when we're giving recommendations on topics like insurance, our recommendations are in your best interest. We're not getting kickbacks or commissions from selling you insurance products. There's no revenue sharing. We're just providing you with great advice with your best interest in mind. The other 88 a percent of firms out there are salesmen. They're pitching products, selling insurance, or putting mutual funds in your portfolio that offer revenue sharing or other kickbacks. After we've talked about all of these topics, I'm sure you're thinking, what does this mean for you? 
So as you can see from today's topics, we have an in-depth understanding of Shell's benefit plans, and we help our clients make the right decisions for them and their family when it comes to open enrollment. And we're always working in your best interest. We are a fiduciary firm. Um, and one of the other big uniques about our firm is that we do help our clients with ongoing tax planning, as well as tax preparation and filing. So if you do have questions, please do not forget, there's going to be a survey that will pop up following this webinar. Please place your questions in there. A member of our team will follow up with you with a detailed answer. Um, you can also follow Willis Johnson and Associates on LinkedIn, Facebook, or you can scan the QR code here on the slide to follow me on LinkedIn as well for additional informational content. If you are more interested in coming to meet with us and learning more about how we can help you and build you a comprehensive financial plan, we do offer a complimentary first meeting where we'll look at your Shell benefit plans, what your compensation is at Shell, tax planning and op optimization strategies. We'll look at your current investment portfolio, do a review and provide recommendations as well. So thank you very much for your time today. I hope you have a wonderful day.